So welcome to my workshop here. Uh, I called it Come and Be Welcome Inclusive Events Planning. Uh, my name is Margaret Young. Also, I am uh, in the midst of also getting, as a mixed race person, I have two names. And I'm hoping to have registered the name Yang Jin as uh, my persona's Chinese name. And my mundane name is Bridget Liang. Uh, and I use they and them pronouns. So I wanted to start this workshop by doing a land acknowledgement um, for my area because it is particularly important to talk about uh, within an SCA context that our relationship with the land and with the people who lived on the land so and still live on the land. And so the area known as Takaranto has been the home of the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. Today, many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities have found uh, ways to survive and thrive despite colonization. We acknowledge the harm caused and attempt to reconcile by following the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region so everyone can have enough to survive for generations to come. We have a responsibility to this land, to each other, and to our local treaties. It's time for us to listen to Indigenous leadership and work together, making a place where everyone can survive and thrive together. And so it is uh, beneficial to get to know what uh, your local uh, Indigenous histories are and what treaties uh, are you're supposed to be bound to as people living on this land. So this is just a little call to um, think more about your relationship with the land. And I wanted to introduce this, um, this presentation with a bit of song because I am a bard and singing is one of the things I like to do as a means to hit knowledge making a little bit differently. Maybe you'll get something else uh, from singing versus um, the presentation itself. So come and be welcome wherever you hail from. Share all the secrets and joys of your art. For every new voice that joins in the chorus will uplift the spirit and cheer the heart. Come from the forest and sit round the fire. Come from the fields and enter our hall. Come drink from the guest cup. Come join in our circle. Come and be welcome, ye bards, one and all. And it's by... Uh, our great Laurel, Emmerich, and Aiden, and Eldemir, and this famous song is one of the songs we often like to introduce um, events and bardics with. So welcome. Do whatever you need to feel comfortable as long as it doesn't distract others. Fidget, game, knit, chat with others with the mic, mic off. You don't need to keep your video on, save your bandwidth, so I'm glad folks are choosing to do it. Uh, but for some people, keeping on your video may help people people feel more comfortable to talk. It's uh, it, it, it's it's not something you have to do. It's audio, obviously audio off unless you're speaking. Typing answers is totally acceptable. Please flag if you are typing if you can. Um, while I am in uh, the slideshow, I will not be. I can read. Uh, typed answers, but it is a little bit harder for me to access. And if you're on video, of course, please wear some kind of clothes. PJs are acceptable. <laughs> These are probably not things that have to be said, but it's, it's good to repeat anyways. So as well, I have some disclaimers. This workshop may bring up difficult feelings. You may feel angry with me. You may feel guilt. <clears throat> Take a moment to hold these feelings. This may be a learning moment for you. Take care of yourself, walk away and come back, get something to drink, 
or a snack. The points made here are designed to make you think and hopefully change your thoughts, attitudes, and heart. Also, as another warning, I am a human too, and there are things I will miss and things I don't know. Some of the outcomes inspire new ways of thinking about inclusion and planning events, synthesize the concept of universal design and inclusive design into events planning, discuss strategies to make even uh, to make events safer for everyone. And I add a little picture here of someone uh, who's lined up a bunch of blocks that say exclusion and is being turned into inclusion. So if folks are feeling brave, let me learn a little bit more about you. What kind of events planning have you done in the past and present? And what do you know about universal design, inclusive design, and or DEI? And so I will need to find where the chat is because it disappeared on me. There it is. Okay. Um, does anyone feel like talking right now while I go and let the cat in? Sure, I could go uh, as the moderator. I guess it, it's okay. Um, I have. Uh, inherited some land in mid realm and I have been, it was a farm and I have been like mm, turning the field back into a forest in a native forest of what would been there after the last ice age. And so I'm very interested in turning that place into some sort of a living history, um, primitive skills kind of area for um, queer kids or, you know, um, as I am queer myself. Um, and so just having like a safe space where they can, you know, get, I was very impacted as a child going to living history museums and interpretive sites. And so um, that's kind of the lens I'm looking at it through is like, huh, how would I even begin planning events for that kind of a space? Mm -hmm. Also, hello, say hello to Biggs, the Zoom cat. Oh my gosh. Oh. He was begging to come in. He was scratching at the door repeatedly. Anyone else want to introduce themselves and what they're doing or their experiences with planning events? Um, I'm Owen Svartaga. We share a kingdom. Uh, but what I've been doing with a friend is that we've been putting together our own group and I'm good at managing humans, but with the event spaces already set up. And so I've come here to learn how to set up events for one, which I know isn't going to be like the main topic of the conversation, but also to help make them run smoothly. Uh, so, yeah. We got space for one more person if someone wants to respond. Hi, I'm uh, Grando Mamigonian, and I am Armenian from the Middle East in real life and here in the SCA. And as far as um, what I, I've been doing, I have been pretty much obsessing and um, on Facebook to always share stuff about my culture and Middle Eastern culture because I believe that uh, education and exposure is a key to people understanding. And I'm lucky that the feedback that I'm getting once in a while, because I'm always afraid that I'm, I'm being too overzealous with it, but I, the feedback I get is people really appreciate that. But that's how I've been using Facebook as a tool to sort of um, introduce people to a culture that they know they normally don't really study when they look at history books in their schools. Thank you. 
it's it's good to see that we have a wide variety of people in the room from their experiences and what kind of planning they've done in the past. This gives me a little bit of an idea of uh, where people are at. So I'm going to be playing a little game with everyone as one of the uh, one of the activities. It's a modified drinking game that called Never Have I Ever. Um, it's a way to get us thinking about the things that people may experience in life and at events. Uh, so no, there won't be any drinking unless you really want to and you're doing it on your own. So if you agree or mostly agree with the, the statements I'll be saying, count it as a point. So like that, if you want. If a statement doesn't apply to you, it does not count as a point. So the, the phrasing is a little bit confusing. Another way of thinking about it is I have never. So whenever I say never have I ever, an easier way to say it would be I have never. It just, the game is called Never Have I Ever. You are free to pass if you want to. You don't have to participate if you don't want to. And at the end of the activity, you have the option to share the number of points that you have. Once again, not mandatory. It just, it, it might be fun to, to share. You do not need to share which answers you um, and uh, have on the list. This is how it's different from the drinking game. Sorry, to clarify, yes. the point is, so this game's always confused me, so this yep. is not like a new thing. Um, mm -hmm. The points are if it doesn't apply to you, so it's never have I ever, and then if you never, you get a point? No, it's no. the opposite. If okay. this is something you agree with, if something I say is something you agree with, you get you give yourself a point. Okay. So if you have ever done it, you get a point. Yes. Okay. Correct. There's, Sorry there's about so that. many so many like quadruple negatives that go on in this game. Yes. I just wanted to be sure. It is a little bit. I will be. I will be saying never have I ever. But you can, in your head, think about it as, I have never done this. This is why it's a little bit of a confusing. I really should edit this game. Never have I ever feared harassment using a bathroom. As a reminder, this could be framed as, I've never feared harassment using a bathroom. Actually, might as well just say it that way. I have never avoided attending an event because I couldn't afford to go. And you can answer this either as SEA specific or just in life in general. I have never had no way, oh, that was another double negative, to, att uh, to attend an event without transportation help. I have never had trouble finding garb in my size. I've never had to skip a feast because nothing slash very little of the food served fit my dietary needs. I have never felt unable to voice a complaint for fear of repercussion. I have never walked alone at night uh, fearing harassment. And now the cat wants out. I have never lacked people with personas from the same culture as me in the kingdom. I have never felt unsafe in the presence of police officers. I have never had to think about or do sex work to make ends meet. I have never had to skip an event because there was no one to watch the kids. And I have uh, I've never, or so I should have gone over the phrasing better. I could, I, I have never, 
could not advance in my chosen craft in the SEA because no one would mentor me. And so, anyone feel like disclosing what their number was? So, did anything on this list surprise you? No, no surprises particularly. And I was, it was nice to have food issues addressed. Yes. Um, yeah, this is, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a little introduction to, to Easter. Um, and how does this activity relate to the ideals of chivalry? Okay, I'm going to uh, give everyone just a couple more moments if they are typing. You can also make a reaction if you're going to be typing out an answer. Typing. Okay. <clears throat> And hopefully that there will be some, in the next slide, we'll get to talk a little bit more about uh, the ideals of chivalry and some of the other issues that may, uh, some of the, the SE specific experiences and terms. Okay, I'm just going to read out what's being said here as the technology. Seems to me that if the SEA is based on honor and chivalry as a goal, we should be making sure that people's experiences of oppression in the outside world can at least be buffered by how we treat each other here. That's a good point. And so this brings us to actually Speaking of um, honor and chivalry and hopefully being able to uh, buffer how we treat each other here, how well do you know the SEA's core values? This is supposed to be the ideals that, um, that guide everything that we do in the SEA. So I, made a, I have a direct link already uh, created for the SEA's mission statement and core values. Really, cat. Sorry, I, I hear my cat scratching at the door again. Would anyone like to read out the mission statement uh, or the first paragraph of the mission statement? Cats like chivalry. Sure, I can do it. We wanted someone to read that out loud, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, yes, the Society for Creative Anachronism is an international nonprofit. Vol Wait, or was I supposed to start at Core Values? You could start at uh, the mission statement, yes. Okay, cool. An international nonprofit volunteer educational organization. The SCA is devoted to the research and recreation of pre 17th century skills, arts, combat culture and employing knowledge of world history to enrich the lives of participants through events, 
demonstrations, and other educational presentations and activities. In pursuing its mission, the SCA is committed to excellence in its programs, communications, and activities. Would someone, thank you, thank you very much. Um, would someone be willing to read the SCA's core values? Here's my bribe of Zoom cat. I can read it. No one else is jumping at it. The SCA core values are to act in attendance in accordance with the chivalric values Virtues. Wow, I can read today. To act in accordance with the chivalric virtues of honor and service in all interactions with SCA members and participants. To be a responsible steward of SCA resources. To deal fairly with others and value and respect the worth and dignity of all individuals. To practice inclusiveness and respect diversity to promote a safe and respectful environment for all SCA members and participants, to act with transparency, fairness, integrity, and honesty, to maintain a harassment-free environment in SCA spaces, and to avoid behavior that reflects adversely on the SCA or other SCA members and participants. Thank you. And so it is uh, interesting to see that in our core values, we particularly are, we uh, respect the worth and dignity of all individuals, practice inclusiveness and respect diversity, to promote a safe and respectful environment for all SCA members and participants. To maintain a harassment free environment, to act with transparency, fairness, integrity, and honesty. And of course, avoid behavior that reflects adversely on the SCA. These are all interesting things to, to think about when, as we are going through this um, presentation. So why do we need explicitly inclusive event planning? We live in a world where some people are treated as subhuman. It is something that is very unfortunate, but due to some of the ways that we express our genders, our sexualities, um, our uh, the way we're born with disabilities or acquire them, uh, the color of our skin, all these traits that are not things that we have chosen that are not our actions, some people will treat us as a less than human. And the thing is, everyone should be worthy of respect, dignity, and kinship. This should be the standard that we set everything on. And is also reflected in the core values. And as people who are taking leadership roles, we need to be more active to ensure that everyone can be welcome. Is anyone familiar with the cosplay is not consent movement? Yogan? Did you want to speak to it at all? I know the cat wants out again. And Gwilik has said, I'd, rather, I'd never realized before that the SA core values list is focused almost entirely on treating each other well. It's not well connected to the mission statements. So for those who are not familiar with the cosplay is not consent movement, out of um, a sometimes overlapping community of the cosplay anime convention people. Um, there, 
there's been a major issue of female cosplayers getting uh, sex, uh, sexually harassed for their outfits. And this has uh, turned into, um, and due to how often it's happened, it, it became a movement where uh, just because someone is wearing a sexy outfit, they should not be touched without their consent. They should not be catcalled. They should not be treated as a less than human. And so going back to the SCA, um, this is an example of a uh, of an action that was taken by both uh, fans and organizers that helped to make the space a little bit safer and more dignified for um, female SCA, sorry, not SCA, cosplayers. And this, the, the, the struggle, the, this, this act of trying to make things more equitable, more dignified, more respectful, can be a very, very difficult struggle. It could be, even be a fight. And hence we have this, there is the term of the social justice warrior because fighting to have people treated as human beings and be worthy of respect, dignity, and kinship can be like fighting a war. So I wanted to throw some theory at people. This is one of the teaching tools I like to use to talk about different models of trying to address um, the, the issues that a lot of us face. In our reality, we see in this first picture here, um, we see one person who is very tall and is standing on a whole bunch of boxes to watch this baseball game. There's one person who is of medium height and is uh, sitting on standing on one box and is able to watch the baseball game just fine. And there's someone who is really short, who is in a ditch and cannot look over the fence to watch the baseball game. This is this is not fair. This is not right. This is an example of of things we want to to fix and remedy because. It's it's it goes against our values, and it's treating some people as a less than human, and that's not okay. And so there have been various models and ways to try to address this this issue. One of which is the concept of equality, which is where everyone is given the same thing. So everyone is given one box to stand on. The tall person, he can still stand on the box just fine, or not even he, they can stand on the box just fine. The in person is still in one box and everything is normal. And the short person is on one box like everyone else and still can't see the game over the, the fence. And so some people have tried the model of thinking called of equity, where they're given different uh, amount of resources in order to have the same result at the end. And so the tall person who is really tall does not need to be standing on any boxes to watch the game and is still able to watch the game just fine without any boxes. The medium sized person is on one box and once again is still able to see the game just fine. And the short person finally is on two boxes and can finally see over the fence. Now, this is a decent option because at the end of the day, the short person ends up getting to watch the game. But in reality, uh, one of the issues with equity as a model is that um, the other two people, the tall person and the medium-sized person will look at the small person as particularly and be like, why do you get all of that help? Why do you get all these boxes? And they resent the, the short person for getting all these boxes, all this support, when they don't realize or think about how the short person needs these two boxes in order to have the same level of participation as them. And so one of the other models that people have talked about is the model of liberation. Get rid of the fence. So everyone can just watch the game just fine. And so this 
this model of liberation is, I guess you could say, the spirit behind what we're trying to do as event planners and as people who are trying to make things better so everyone is able to par participate and feel welcome. I want to also uh, introduce the concept of universal design. It is um, from the disability movement, a man named Ronald Mace, who was one of the founders of this concept, described it as universal design is the design of product and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. An equity-based uh, resource distribution can easily come under threat. For example, it would cost half the event budget to hire a sign language interpreter. We can't afford it. So universal design is um, a way to uh, design spaces, so built environments, buildings, streets, all these sorts of things as well as events and classrooms and all sorts of other institutions and things as something where it is uh, that anyone is able to uh, access it and access it easily. And so the, the spirit behind universal design is accept the diversity of humans and design a world where people can thrive as they are. So, um, Taking this as a little step further than what universal design intended itself to be originally, imagine a future where an autistic, deaf, black trans woman who used a wheelchair becomes queen. Imagine a world where that is actually possible. And yes, I'm using an actual person I know um, as like the most diverse example I could imagine. <clears throat> so, universal design has some um, limitations. It's focused primarily on disability, which is legitimate in its own way. Um, and it also, um, people have taken it up in ways where it's not about disability at all. And then it's then disabled people can't even make use of the universal design because it's not actually, they're not in mind when people are designing spaces or uh, events or anything. A world where it wouldn't be noteworthy would be even better. It's hard to imagine how to get from here to there. Yes. Um, imagine a world where it would be unremarkable for an autistic deaf black trans woman who uses a wheelchair being queen. Instead of having people in the comments section being like, ooh, diversity hire. So as I guess somewhat of a response to universal design is the concept of inclusive design. So, uh, and this concept is about how we need everyone to step up and work towards creating a barrier free world where everyone can thrive. So it takes these universal design principles and applies them to address underlying issues like racism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, and other social issues. This may be difficult to do because it requires us to predict the needs of people who are different from ourselves, regardless of what, what position we are in the world. Even as someone who has a physical disability and is autistic, um, it does not mean that I am good at uh, providing support for people who are visually impaired or who use wheelchairs um, or who are capital D deaf. These are, uh, these are all things that we have to learn from and we, uh, this is why we need to work collectively to be able to better support everyone. Uh, and so what I'd like to say is we need to learn different protocols and customs to be able to respect 
and be courteous to each other and to various other identities and experiences. So an example of different uh, customs and protocols that folks should uh, learn or to be respectful is that sometimes there are people who will use they and them pronouns. Does any, can anyone think of any other customs or protocols people should learn in order to be respectful to their own social locations and communities? Something that was really cool that the uh, Baroness, the Baron and Baroness of Scrailing All Thing, uh, the Ottawa area in Aldemere did for a friend of mine who was visiting with me at the event that day, who was very, very shy. Uh, we've developed a custom in the past couple of years to try to be very welcoming in Eldamere of newcomers to give call all newcomers up into court at the end of court and thank them for coming welcome them back and give them a mug but my friend was so shy that she was a like she was freezing up at the very thought of having to go up in front of all of these strangers and so uh, they offered that they could that she could just get her cup off to the side and not only that um did did like they didn't just hand it to her and be like okay thanks bye they actually had a conversation with her and also gave her a ring to thank her for coming to a place that was so overwhelming for her but she was so dedicated to wanting this new experience that she did it anyway and that really honored all of the barriers that she was facing and the effort that she put forth. It was, it was really sweet. And she told me afterwards that it was a fantastic experience. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of consideration and inclusiveness that it'd be great to see more often. And Cold Dawn has had many holidays, yes. Um, being mindful and considerate of uh, the holidays that we all have. Actually, do you want to expand on this? Uh, not really. I'm not the best at it, but I just know, like, it's a little thing I do in the workplace because I manage our days off and our calendars and stuff. And so I've just decided to be very mindful around what I'm saying and, like, also researching other holidays that are happening around the same times and putting those on the calendar as well, because they're equally as important to, there's more than just getting the day off or something like that, but that's it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really important. If we are scheduling events in particular, if we're able to make sure it doesn't fall on someone's uh, major high holy day, it's, it, it's, it's great. It's particularly meaningful, for, especially if a king kingdom has a lot of people from that particular culture. Also, at part three. So as a way to practice this, I wanted to use the example of Zootopia. It's one of my favorite examples to think about universal design, inclusive design, and what it really, really means to include people and so while we're going to be watching this video, notice, take, pay attention to the kinds of technologies that were put into this world that help to make all the different kinds of mammals thrive in the city of Zootopia. And could I get, uh, and it'd be, I'd appreciate if some people could try to name three technologies after the video. And due to the uh, constraints of technology, um, I will be playing the actual song off my phone. It won't be the best. Uh, so hopefully this works.
Sorry about that. Okay, <clears throat> so Willick said climate-controlled environments so that cold, spe uh, cold climate and hot climate species don't have to put up with the discomfort of a one-size-fits-all temperature environment. What other technologies did you notice? I'll give one example. Did you notice that uh, the smoothie bar had um, some kind of zoom tubey thing for the giraffe, where the smoothie went up the zoom tube up to where the giraffe could reach? Did you notice the public transportation services, different heights, different types of phones and tablets? Yes, these are all amazing things that we've noticed. Um, yeah, the public transport, uh, the transportation came in all different heights, so different sized mammals were able to all take the public transit and not get squished or cramped. Hippo dryer, yep, those are great. Um, and the different kinds of phones and tablets because there are animals of various sizes and shapes and different kinds of hand structures. Lots of hooves. Um, does, does everyone have one more example that they noticed of techno how technology helped to make different animals thrive in Zootopia? Uh, they each had different, like, quote unquote, cultural stores. Uh, yeah. In the Winter Wonderland, they had like a fish market because they ate a lot of fish. I'm not sure if there were any in um, the, like the the desert land or like the rainforest because I don't know if it showed that much, but they had stores that were suited to their diets and needs for like the area too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so this is a really good example of how to live and how to respect and how to support all different kinds of peoples coming together into a space together and designing a space, designing a city where everyone's able to thrive and do their thing and all the same space together. This is why events planning really takes so much work is when you really care for all the kinds of people in the world, 
it takes so much work to try to get it to somehow uh, fit together. It is often in real life, it is very often not perfect. So an example is um, even in this workshop, I wasn't able to um, have captions for folks who needed ca uh, to be able to follow along via reading. Um, my sound system didn't quite work out. And, and there's probably more I can't think of off the top of my head. There will often be conflicts between groups because it's inevitable to happen. It's, you know, it is actually possible to make a one size fits all approach. Oh, more things. So Billick also said, I can see that translating into SCA context by encouraging crafting and merchanting of many, many cultures. There's such a heavy Norse, Celtic and Saxon influence in Eldamere that it can be hard to find simple things like belt buckles for other cultures. Yes. Yes. I'm not going to make any comments. As a partly Chinese persona. Sorry, you were mid-sentence. So, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, that, that is fine. I wanted to do some activities with folks here. Um, if you're willing to do some talking, if not, I can be a talking head for all of you. Um, I wanted to uh, come up with some scenarios to actually, does anyone have any ones they really want to do here? Or ones that I do not want to do? I wonder whether if nothing on here necessarily fits what's on people's minds, if there is a particular situation that you're currently facing or something that had, that had come up that had stuck in your mind, maybe that could be an alternative too. Mm -hmm. I definitely had the, expect uh, the thought that, oh, these are going to be like, all the big events plenary people who have experience, all the experiences with it. So I just came up with some ideas. Ooh. Fonts from Magnifica Cristaldi. Uh, for example, the very basics shouldn't be difficult, like having large enough restrooms to accommodate wheelchairs, or having seeing that accommodates large people or small people, having smooth ground or benches for people with mobility issues. Yes, I later on um, I will be offering a checklist of various things people can do to make spaces more physically accessible for people. Thinking about the coronation thing as well, and this would be. This would apply for any event where um, a significant number of people's names are being read out or announced by a herald. There was a wonderful workshop um, also done in our area a number of years ago by someone who was a, a voice herald, a court herald, and who had a very complicated, like multisyllabic name it was not Western European who was fed up with the number of times that her SCA name had been mispronounced. And so she did a workshop about pronunciation of names from about 30 different cultures and how to confidently scream that name at the top of your lungs if you had never said it before to get an idea of you know, how to sound them out um, how to recognize at least the part of, a, of the world that a name might be from and give you an idea, it, you know, what kind of sound does that E make? Um, it, it was one of the best heralding workshops I've ever attended. Yeah, getting people's names right is very important. I purposely went for a very simple name for the purpose, for expressly this purpose. Um, Margaret is incidentally uh, the name that my persona chose 
in order to walk around the for the foreigners and just it's equivalent of a John Doe type name. This is a name which he liked and picked it. So on the list of things, I just made a small list of some things that could be done to think about when planning for the event and also some of the things that could be done day of as soon as the technology works. I just lumped them together into some categories. A number of the things when we th when we co are considerate of all, uh, uh, disabled folks and, uh, and our elders, I just split them into some categories um having access to safe bathrooms that are uh, ideally single stall and large enough for people to get into and have a lock um having doors that are wide enough for people to go through um the spacing between aisles and spaces that people are supposed to uh travel through and just in general the ability to get to all major locations without stairs this is important for a lot of different populations because people who use mobility devices of any kind, people who uh, use um, strollers, who have small children and babies, and also just in general, people carrying very heavy things. So people having to wheel in like a giant thing of armor or people who are trying to bring in um, the the uh what's it called the throne would really appreciate having smooth ground to walk through and no stairs and also accepting uh the the contrib uh, people who are support people and support animals in spaces and also providing volunteers willing to do small things like guarding a door opening a door closing a door um, doing directions, uh, being able to um, talk more explicitly about instructions, a host of different things that people could do to be courteous and uh, make sure that people are having the best experience they can. I split the next one into sensory. Oh, service is important to me, but if I never had to have a throne up onto an eight foot stage again, I wouldn't be upset. Yes. <laughs> This is one of the reasons why it's really important to think about mobility is regardless of who we are, uh, mobility is something that affects all of us and your volunteers will thank you. They will have to, whoever is, your pelicans will thank you for not having to lug up a heavy eight foot uh, throne onto a stage. So some of the issues with sensory brains and things could include having access to big text having particularly loud heralds, having access to silent heralds, quiet spaces, microphones, give or take if people accept them, reducing noise in general. Um, so it, when people are making announcements, it would be really great to get pe everyone to shut up so everyone is able to hear the very loud heralds. Um, having questions around lighting, is the lighting too bright? Is it too dim? These are all questions that could be need to be thought about. And also sense. Are people going to be doing a uh, going to be wearing excessive amounts of perfume? Uh, if there is a perfumed uh, workshop, um, where are they located? Um, are people allowing for cigarette smoking everywhere or uh, depending on where you are, marijuana smoking. Um, these are all things to think about when it comes to people's senses. And when it comes to neurodiversities, so different kinds of brains, having having volunteers who are able to listen to if things are not going so well with someone, having people able to give explicit instructions, having lots of signage, so people, there's it's convenient to find a place instead of if you're trying to find where is this where it is, uh, is this where the building is, or is that where the room is, it's really good to have big visible signage that people can see from a mile away, not literally a mile away. It's important 
for chatelaines to be available with easy referrals and having a good database of um, things that the chatelaine can refer to for whatever it is people are looking for. So this could include things like transportation or um, groups to uh, for um, finding transportation as an example. And in general, having volunteers and various staff and support people just treat people as human beings, not as someone to pity, not as someone to uh, baby, just as people. And it's useful to really think about uh, poverty and the, uh, the issues that people have when they can't afford things. So it'd be nice to see things like reduced or sponsored tickets for events or memberships. Um, th I've seen people do them occasionally, but it's not something that's done regularly. The thing um, is about the ticket events, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, I've been attending some of the Barony of Den Ben Dunfirth uh, meetings because they're held before bite practice. And by Eldemir, sorry, yeah. I think SCA, like as the corporation, um, they have rules where you can't necessarily just randomly comp tickets because then yeah. if you do do that, if you do apply that, sometimes the person doing that might not always be the most trustworthy mm -hmm. and therefore they could comp their whole family or they could comp friends or et cetera, because yeah. they, uh, Ben Dunferth especially, have been looking into comping tickets for the baronials, especially because they have to meet a certain amount of events attendance, especially on like the king and queen level, but they still have to pay that. They still have to pay for all of them. They have to pay for their families and everything, and that kind of gets expensive as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a thing where they have to right into like the local quote unquote bylaws of the barony that it has to be a definitive answer of this will always be in effect as well as it has to be something really specific because it's in legal terms and yes. so with that the tickets also are more expensive nowadays because they used to be more like a little bit more cheaper because venues are trying to recover from money, like the losses that they've made during COVID. So sometimes things like that aren't necessarily able to be comped because there has to be a margin met as well um, just mm -hmm. to help pay for the venue as well. Uh, there used to be feast money in, in that included and like things like that. So being able to reduce the ticket price isn't the easiest thing because of so many different things working into it legal wise and like insurance and all of that. Yeah. Sorry. It's a challenge. It is yeah. definitely a challenge. Um, I'm only speaking about these are some of the ideals. Uh, there are a lot of things that people just cannot do just due to capacity or what the situation is. Uh, Tanakh, hello. Um, sorry to get late. Try not to interrupt the class or cover a topic that has been previously discussed. Yeah, so um, I don't know when you joined in. We are currently just talking about some of the ways that we can make um, events more accessible to everyone. Um, so the ideal right now we're talking about is reduce slash sponsored tickets. Um, there are issues with it, but it is something to at least keep in mind. Is there a way to do um, it so people can afford to come? Can people have transportation to the, the event? <clears throat> Um, they are going to be, uh, and Shoshana has asked great ideas. Are these going to be recorded somewhere? These, uh, this is a recorded session, so it will be posted onto uh, the Kingdom's um, YouTube. Um, 
So yeah, other things that could be useful to have on this list here include also access to childcare and also programming for children and youth. It'd be really great to have people who are able to not just watch children, but also have fun with the children and have them do things that are meaningful and SEA related. <clears throat> And so I love together LGBTQ, racialized folks, and gender groups into one group just because um, there are some overlap. It just, um, the, the specifics can be talked about uh, in more specific. <clears throat> so some of the issues that can arise and would be really good and supportful for these groups include having better representation. So in the pictures that are posted on the website, in the language that is used, on the things that we do, um, there's a host of different things that folks can talk about when it comes to representation. Um, questions about stigma. So uh, making people feel like there's something wrong with them for existing or existing in that particular space. Um, one example of stigma is trans people and washrooms, our favorite topic. Or um, a racialized person doing um, a workshop on, uh, let's just say, Celtic blacksmithing. Issues of violence and accountability to violence. So the bad things that can happen to folks at events that don't get addressed. Uh, one of the examples being the second question I came up with here. Um, there are people who are definitely not very good and are doing untoward things to young girls and or the women in general. And these are things that need to be addressed. And um, of course, language, the words that we use, how we address people. It's very interesting that we are so willing to learn the, diff the difference between your highness, your majesty, and uh, I don't remember the others offhand. All these different forms of address, but we don't always learn. Um, we uh, People do are not are le a lot less likely to put in the effort to learn people's pronouns, um, people's certain, uh, their cultural groups is terms that are considered offensive and to not say those words, all sorts of things that could be talked about. Does anyone want to bring up any of these questions here? Okay, so I'm seeing a response here. One way to get past the comp or making affordable is to make your event donation only as long as you are fairly certain your group can cover the difference if you don't make up the cost of the site. It is a way as from Kelsey, West Kingdom, NMR uh, Deputy. Yeah, that could be one way that could be, um, uh, that could be or, uh, how the space could be organized. Um, hmm. Does anyone like to add their own contributions to some of the ways that we can just at this high level think about and consider how people can be included? I can. Oh. I will go after other people because I'm here to cheerlead as much as I am anything else. Your, your camera's on first, so you get to go first. That's that's the role that I made and I decided. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mundanely, I've been working in the developmental disability service sector for a little over half a year now and engaged with it as a disabled person before that. And one of the hugest issues that the entire disability service sector has faced since it began was the 
anytime someone would come up with an idea and be like, hey, like we have this problem. Hey, what if we tried blank? The response generally ends up being, that's too difficult. We can't afford it. We tried that before and it didn't work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Responses that end up shutting down creativity. And I've noticed that that happens in the SCA a lot too. And I went to a course, not just a workshop, but a course, where one of the best things it presented was an alternative. It's not toxic positive thinking of like, we can do anything, live your dreams without any connection to reality, but instead it's solution focused thinking. That if you encounter a problem, don't talk about the problem and the problems with any proposed solutions. Talk about what it would be like if the problem had been fixed, what that might look like, and then work backwards from, okay, we fixed it. What would it, what would it, like, what would an event be like if that problem weren't a problem anymore? Okay, how would we have gotten there? And step by step, you work back to where you currently are. And at no point did you encounter, a, oh, we couldn't do that. Because you were working from, if this is our goal, we can get there somehow. And working as well with the strengths of people and groups, thinking what are we good at and what do we value that we can use and leverage to get there from here. And I, I feel like a solution and strengths-based problem-solving approach around DEI in general, like at a super high level, would really benefit groups across the known world. Mm -hmm. So this would be a good opportunity to jump over to uh, the slide that I um, had for after having a discussion about all different experiences of people. So indications of success, having more diverse crowds at events, being able to see people of color in the crowd, being able to see visibly queer and trans people in the crowd, being able to see a bunch of people with varying disabilities in the crowd. Be, see these people in, uh, keep engaged and they're trying for positions of power and getting them. Being able to see the uh, all kinds of people getting recognized for uh, with awards for their talents. Having the that queer singer uh, manage to get a laurel in Bardic over the course of a decade of being actively involved in Bardic. I'm just giving an example. And seeing that people are developing friendships and colleagues and community within the SCA. These are the things I think are important and other people can name things that are a good way to indicate that we've we've succeeded. Does anyone have their own ideas of what success could look like at this grand scale uh, that we want to see at the end? So actually, um, I'm, I'm going to tie my thoughts together because the thought I had on the last slide directly ties into this, which is um, I uh, kind of actually similar to what Willock was talking about with you know, that solution focused problem solving, you know, really trying to see what is that end result, what are the steps to get into the end result, kind of working backwards as opposed to so much on focusing on the, we can't do this right now part of it. Um, I also have a bit of a gripe with, and I mean, I've, I've said this before, people know I'm a broken record on this, performativeness of a lot of solutions. And that directly ties into those indications of success because a lot of the times, and I'm being recorded, so I will use politer words. A lot of the times, um, solutions that people come up with and suggest in the SCA are 
let's say self-congratulatory <laughs> where we did it, we, we, we changed this or we implemented this policy, but that's not necessarily an indication of success. Um, I'll give an example that recently came up, came up. Um, there was a big kind of a push to do everything gender neutral within our kingdom, you know, every title, every, you know, not, not, not have any genders at all, maybe spoken by heralds or what have you, um, every title automatically be gender neutral. Uh, it's good. It's a, it's a really important option for some people, but also some people that are trans, for example, want their trans identity recognized. They, they want to have that gender affirmation. Um, and so, you know, they would like they would they some people spoke up and said well hey i i you know i am trans i identify as you know um i'm i'll use i'm not i identify as male let's just put it that way yeah so they'll say like yeah i'm trans i identify as male i really want male pronouns and i really want a male title and what have you um and and you know it's not that you can't have both it's not that you know these things can't exist together it's just that sometimes we we have like an idea and we're like well this works in some cases and so therefore let's just use it for all cases as opposed to understanding that a lot of these pol policies at the end of the day it's they need flexibility mm -hmm. uh, and the only way you're going to see success on a broad scale is if a lot of these implementations are flexible and adaptive uh, and so when we talk about indication of success you know sometimes it's helpful to not think in singular merits Sometimes it's helpful to think in multiple avenues. Does this does this solution work in these multiple ways? The way you reach out to a minority group is not going to be the same way depending on the minority group. Um, I know that you know those of us who do uh, things that are considered um, you know very niche in the SA, like Indigenous studies, we get lumped together. But I can tell you from a fact, from personal life experience, that not every indigenous identity is the same, and not every indigenous identity wants to be grouped together. <laughs> um, you know, there there is a difference between various North American indigenous cultures and Central American indigenous cultures. There's a vast difference, and they don't necessarily want to be in the same category. And so sometimes uh, indications of success also involve feedback from communities and getting directly their response as to does this work for us or not uh, and that that involves big sample sizing so you know along with those diverse crowds at events it's good to see those diverse crowds at the events but are you engaging them are you asking multiple members of those diverse crowds does this work you don't have one singular spoken uh one singular token minority representing this group you know we don't we don't say that oh well now we have a you know we have an African-American minister of science within our kingdom. So therefore they're, they're, they're fully knowledgeable of all issues that would affect African-American individuals within the SCA. It, it doesn't work that way. No one, no one of us is, our cultures are not monolithic for one and no one of us can represent an entirety of diverse groups. So I, I think that, you know, that feedback and that, that understanding that these are continual processes that improve over time is a really important aspect of measuring success and measuring if something is impactful or performative overall. Thank you for the reminder of one of the things I missed. So um, people, another thing that I'm thinking about is people feel comfortable giving feedback to you about things that could be done. And I really like this one example that was in one of my disability textbooks of you're planning a dinner party for a bunch of different friends. This person is a vegetarian. This person has a gluten allergy. This other friend has uh, hates vegetables and only likes to eat meat. How are you going to uh, make a dinner that is uh, amenable to everyone and where they will all feel happy and satisfied with the food uh, provided at this at this meal. Because there's not there, there are some obvious contradictions in the all the, the various dietary needs. You can't make uh, a meal that's completely vegetarian because then the person who does not like vegetables will be pretty upset. Uh, and potentially the, the person who 
is uh, gluten free depending on and has celiac uh, may not um, be able to eat some of the food as well because uh, it may contain traces of gluten, which is bad for them. And so, um, yeah, having this, uh, I'm going to use an academic term, multimodal approach to uh, how we plan events is important. So having multiple ways of doing things. Um, and yeah, a, a good indicator. One of the things that it would lead to success, I guess, is having multiple approaches. So going back to the brainstorming questions, um, just be there will likely be conflicts between various groups. Uh, an example that's used in disability studies is that the things that are useful for uh, people who are blind are can uh, conflict with the things that are helpful for people who use wheelchairs, as an example. So in order to make um, uh, for blind folks, it's useful to have um, textured things on the ground and, um, oh, sorry, that was deaf and blind. Deaf and blind. Anyway, it's all right. The, uh, different example. Uh, textured things on the ground, which help them know, oh, wait, this is where there is a curb that I can walk down. Um, but the, the textured things on the ground can make it more difficult for some mobility devices to get across. Uh, so this is one of the conflicts. Um, the ideal is to be able to build a space where everyone is able to um, navigate a space. And I'm using a very physical example. Um, sometimes it's useful to have a space that is where there is clear ground that's going down a ramp and also some space where there is textured ground. So it's useful to have many different ways of engaging with things to make it uh, a space where everyone can thrive because at the end of the day, it's useful to think about all these people as our friends, as a way to think about it. Is this how you want to treat your friend who has, that you know has issue X, Y, and Z to make it um, a space where they're able to have a good time? Does anyone want to go over any of the other scenarios or are you all good with it today? Oh, I am seeing, Willick says, my mother once commented between your dietary restrictions and mine these days, we might be having ice cubes for dinner next time you come in to visit. Or we have two different main dishes and work together to make it happen. Yeah, that's a, that is, the solution that I forgot to mention. Um, it's useful to have multiple options available in the case of the dinner table. Are there any other things people want to talk about? Any questions that they have around the process of thinking about planning for events in a more D DEI way? Are there specific things people want to know about <clears throat> to make it more um, safe and accessible and a space where everyone can feel welcome? I can just go over the slides if you want to. Sorry, I thought I hear a voice. Yes? I was just wondering um, if you were speaking specifically of disabilities or, or just of mobility issues, because some people would not necessarily consider themselves disabled, but they may be elderly or they may be have difficulty getting around in some way that isn't necessarily being blind or being deaf or being in a wheelchair. They may just, you know, like I have really bad lungs and I have to stop and take breaks it's super handy for me to have a place to stop and sit down for a minute and catch my breath. Yeah. And oftentimes at events, there's nowhere for people to sit unless you specifically know them and they're willing to open their camp to you and share a seat with you. 
another issue is, is I'm a pretty big lady. And there's some places where I really just know that I can't sit there because I will break that. Um, and so having people be aware that having a, a large bench or a chair that will support a big man in armor or a larger lady who has been a mama and has just adopted that mama size and decided to be okay with that because that's who she is. Being able to have spaces like that where people can pause or get out of the sun and into the shade because they overheat quickly or any of those types of things. Those are all different factors to keep people comfortable and feel like they're they're still wanted, I think, but yeah, they're not necessarily I, I, specifically disabled related. Yes, I I probably should, I, I was uh, trying to save on space and try to reduce the amount of text I was putting up and I, I did not go into uh, size particularly. A lot of these uh, intersect with each other and also um, there are similar <clears throat> there are similar needs that can uh, benefit multiple people. So having uh, more more spaces to be able to sit and um, catch your breath or relax or something is something that benefits multiple people. Um, I threw a bunch of different terms together because of similar things that could be talked about and I was trying to reduce the number of sentences. I should have also meant, uh, added size and also other various issues here because um, these are all different populations and needs that do need to be addressed in the planning of events. And part of the ways that one of the ways that we can do this is to get to know the people in our kingdoms and what kinds of things that they need. Uh, and also having the option for people to disclose anonymously over email or other forms of contact um, if they have any needs please email and uh, if they are planning on attending an event and it'll give the, the organizers hopefully more ample time to be able to say oh I, we need to plan for this thing so Gwilik did you have something you wanted to add of course I do <laughs> um, try not to take up too much space but it I'm just continuing to think through the various pieces. And another thing that came up at my mundane workplace just yesterday is that the anti-oppression committee, which I'm really glad we have one of, has been working for ages on trying to come up with an inclusive events worksheet for when we're doing community engagement projects, which is lovely. And I signed up, of course, because I'm excited about this kind of thing and always like to talk too much about DEI uh, to review it, you know, sort of focus group it and take a look. And I was kind of like, I want to like this more than I do um, once I saw it, especially because I know that the people who are working on it worked really hard and I like them and they have really good ideas. And I was like, I'm not incredibly impressed by what's been so far. Um, and I'm just thinking, it, like at the same time, having a worksheet in and of itself is such a good thing. And I'm just thinking, usually they still come from a very deficit-based approach of like, okay, what are we gonna do in case we have that one rare person who has like all of the accessibility needs and all of the marginalized identities Oh no, we have to scramble and make sure they're gonna they're gonna be able to access this or we didn't do it right. Um, and it, it comes back to the thing of like, how dare you need so many boxes to see over the fence from you know from from that example earlier. But I don't think I've ever actually seen it before where in some sort of inclusive event planning, worksheet, checklist, etc. Be like, okay, if you were to have sunshades covering 25% of your event, or you know, if you had two sunshades and cooling stations, 
how many people and populations would that assist? And you could write in, uh, you know, people who are pregnant and have small children and have breathing problems and have temperature regulation problems and who are elderly. And, and suddenly you've covered this huge number of people who would benefit from sunshades. So it's like, of course we should have sunshades. If we have sunshades for our royalty, we should have sunshades for our most vulnerable. And if it's like, okay, if we're gonna go to the expense of having a stairs free site, how many people would benefit? And instead of going, okay, we need this because wheelchair accessibility and we're gonna be terrible people if we don't have, if we have an event site with stairs going, okay, so people who have to lug armor and um, and court gear and who use walkers and wheelchairs and have bad knees and have small children and have strollers and, and all of the merchants, like suddenly it's like, yeah, half our event or more would actually benefit from not having to carry things or walk up stairs. And I, I wonder if that would make it again, a less like we're already struggling and we're never going to get this right approach. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for that feedback and also thought, thought about how to organize um, and to think more about events planning. As someone who is looking furtively around for uh, quality events planning checklists, um, I found a number that were about disability, but it was very hard to find any that were more about inclusive design. And I just posted uh, a link to um, the slides. So if you want to um, check them out to get the links, uh, you are welcome to do so. Um, hmm. In the time that we have left, is there anything folks uh, are also wanting to go over? Any of the issues? I just came up with a few. Would it be okay to share this with our kingdoms and DEI officers? Yes, do it. I'd better actually just quickly add what kingdom I'm from. Just so people know where, which, which kingdom I'm from. Does anyone want to talk about any of the other issues with planning for events or um, any of the issues related to DEI? I wonder from a very practical perspective, I have, I have run or co-run exactly one in-person event in my life. And that was a children's event way back in 2010. Um, and there are so many stages to planning an event. And I wonder if someone is trying to actively engage DEI or antipressive principles for the first time, where and when is the best place to start trying to incorporate that into event planning? At the very beginning, when you're planning all the, the, uh, the visioning, all the things that you're doing, it's, it's useful through the entire process. When you are doing the things, booking the people, um, contacting, advertising, all these, whatever things are you need. And the day of having a bunch of people who are knowledgeable and are able to handle multiple kinds of situations, ideally, and building the physical space and the, also the personal space to do all the things. 
Magni uh, Magnifica Cristel. So uh, I did have two or three other things that I was kind of reminded of. Um, parking can be a major issue. Yes. Because things can be really far away and that by the time somebody gets to site, they've used up their spoons. Um, and then set up crews to help those who may not be able to is something to try and have available. Um, we are fortunate in the West that we have lots of strapping young people uh, who are perfectly happy to help uh, older and disabled people get set up so that they can participate. And there's often a, a give back and forth and, and the, the younger, stronger people who can do the physical lifting part will then get fed fabulous food by the people who make the food. And then it can be a very give and take sort of atmosphere, um, but we have to be careful that we also do not take advantage of the young people who are setting up because they can get hurt, they can get worn out, they can get tired. And we need to be able to remember to respect um, both sides of that equation. Um, the other thing I was gonna touch on went back to your feast with all different types. One, my barony that I live in is the barony of Alicia. And a couple years back, my husband and I did the feast here uh, for Yule, and it was incredibly difficult to be inclusive of everybody because there was so, it, it, your scenario was basically exactly what we had, but on a barony level. And so we had people uh, give us all of their, what they can, what they can't, what they should, what they shouldn't, what their needs were as far as food went. And then my dear beloved husband, spent hours and hours researching to find period foods that would fit within everybody's dietary needs. And there were some people who just couldn't have some items, but for those people, he made additional dishes. Um, and it's one of those things where having a volunteer staff that is willing to go the extra mile to do the extra work to make sure that people know that they're not left out um, and so that they're not left hungry uh, it really does make a huge difference. One of the other things that we found that was that we got a lot of really positive feedback was that for the feast, we provided a menu that had all of the ingredients listed for every dish. Um, That's amazing. And it was like 13 pages long, but that like 40 or 50 bucks that I spent on making copies and making sure that everybody had that actually protected some people who had allergies that showed up that didn't know ahead of time. So they were able to reference that and go, I can't have that. Um, and so that's just one of those ways that it, a lot of paperwork has gone by the wayside, but if even if you don't have the paperwork and make menus available to give to every person in a paper copy, you can do a slide projection of what's there and put it up on the wall so people can just read it as they come in. And you can include a, a list at your serving stations of ingredients so that people know what they can have and what they can't have. Um, it's a little extra work, but it has a big payoff. Exactly. And this is an excellent example of the reason why we do, do all of this. You know? So, um, okay, there I am, okay. Um, so you can you can stop this one if this is oh, I'm gonna put my hand down if this is too far uh, forward in thinking for the for the scope of your presentation. Um, but I often feel like getting people in the door is a small part of the problem. You know, the real thing is actually getting people engaged and, and active and participating. And we we talked a little bit about that when we talked about. Um, you know, helping people to like get people into officerships or positions of power or, or situations where they can actually directly help with the planning, uh, which is incredibly useful for people from backgrounds where, you know, if, if you're from a marginalized background that doesn't get representation, being able to be in that position where you can help influence those policies is, is very important, very impactful. That being said, um, 
oftentimes I feel like these things are talked about in terms of recruitment and numbers and not in helping people grow in the SCA. Like we don't talk about, um, I mean, and you, actually you did. So I want to thank you because you did talk about like, oh, there was this queer Laurel who just got recognized for all the work they did. Like stuff like that is great. And I want like more of that, but I feel like that doesn't happen outside of these conversations that we have. And I think it's the kind of thing where like when we're in that in group, the, the group of the quote unquote marginalized people, we like talk about it amongst ourselves because it's like, oh yeah, there was a, a success from, from our community. Of course, we're gonna talk about it. But I don't, I don't often see that at the same level in the SCA. I don't necessarily mm -hmm. see that society-wide all the time where we're talking about how we can help these people advance. You know, people will quote, oh, I know a knight that is in a wheelchair. Do you, what do we do to help other knights who are wheelchair bound? We just quote that there is a knight who is wheelchair bound. We don't talk about the things that happen to help someone who is, you know, mobility impaired become a knight. We don't, we, we just, we just kind of like, well, we get them in the game and then we just let them go and walk away. And that's something I, I, I would like to hear more thoughts on is after that recruitment, um, uh, section like you know after after we get that person in like what what are ways to actually help people continue growing um thank you for the correction i'm sorry about that wheelchair user thank you for the uh, the language correction yeah you're right um and i was i guess alluding to it ver more th than explicitly because um some of the people i know who are from some marginalized communities haven't been able to progress they may not have the mentors, people willing to mentor them to help them grow and succeed. I'm really fond of plant metaphors because this is what I was being talked about in um, one of my theory texts where people are kind of like plants. They need certain kinds of environments. Uh, some of them are like orchids and have very particular needs. Some of them are more generalists like dandelions and can sprout everywhere and uh, survive in all sorts of different conditions. And they're all valid. They're all plants and they all have different uses and uh, attributes and they're all great. Um, but are we giving them the things that they need to grow and thrive? And I really like the word thriving. Anyways, politics. Um, this idea of thriving means that they're doing the things they want to grow and succeed and do all the things that they want to do. And so like, if we're not giving people the things that they need to succeed and grow, then that's also part of the, uh, the issues that we have. Um, Gwilek, did you have something you wanted to add uh, uh, for feelings? Again, of course they do. Um, and I'm, they act, um, I think you, uh, Egan has headed out, but a, a thing that both Margaret and I got to experience, it was quite interesting at a local event in December called Wasail, was that they had a newcomers circle, not just a circle, but a, an experienced Baron and Chatelaine led an hour long conversation circle for anyone who was interested, newcomers and newcomers at heart essentially, um, to learn more about the structure of the SCA and how to do things and why the hell do we do that? Uh, and it was fabulous. I learned things that I hadn't known or I needed my information updated on and I have been in the SCA technically for my entire life because my parents had me when they were still involved and there's things I don't know. So if there's things I don't know that would benefit my participation, like how to engage in something, how important could that be to someone who, for whom this is their first or third event or who gets overlooked for someone taking them under their wing. And I, I keep thinking that some sort of like 
encouraging established members and households to um, to sponsor essentially someone that they don't think is going to be a good fit for them. Like the, not the like best and brightest get supports because they shine, but the person who no one ever notices, like scan, scan the room who never speaks. And has, uh, and has similar interests. Yeah, but, but you know, like finding ways to support the people who don't get supported through our traditional like one-to-one -one mentorship, like a knight takes on a squire, a pelican takes on a protege, a laurel takes on an apprentice kind of things. Because those usually work by, I like you, I think you're going to succeed. We don't do much to support people we don't think are going to shine. And so we don't give people who don't look shiny many opportunities. I, I think there's ways to foster that. This is one of the reasons why I think chatelains should uh, are really important is they're the face and uh, the the guide, I guess you could say, or the beacon uh, for a lot of new people. And the thing that uh, Baron Brand did by having this newcomer section was really important. So. In, uh, in the interest of time, because we're actually using up the full two hours I allotted for this, I wanted to just have a few takeaways um, for people to think about when it comes to um, planning for events and um, being involved and uh, thinking more about who, uh, about equity, equality, liberation, all these sorts of concepts, and DEI. Think about who is absent from the room and find out why. Which people have come into the room and have left because it wasn't a space where they were able to thrive in. This is the plant that didn't manage to take to the soil as an analogy. What do people need in order to thrive and be their best? And I encourage to help build each other up. We are stronger together than we are divided. And these are all things that are that could be found in our um, code of ethics. We need to combat attitudes that devalue various diverse peoples trying to thrive. The other day I heard in uh, one of the SEA groups I'm involved with that a, a trans woman heard a peer talk about uh, how her hair should be cut and and by cut I mean cut off because she looks too quote unquote mannish and then and therefore it is disgraceful for someone who is quote unquote a man to have long hair universal and inclusive design need to be the norm of how we think about planning and folklore events and a lot of other things as our discussion has gone. And I really like this term of nothing about us without us. It's something I have a tattoo of. And it means that when we're planning for things that are about a marginalized group, if we're planning for things and we don't have them as part of the process, it, it's not useful. If we're planning for things for, let's just say, um, differently sized folks, um, and we decide, oh, this uh, bench looks fine, and it's made from very a very flimsy wood, and uh, saying we, we've done a good job and making this a thing that's accessible to a lot of people, without consulting them, that, that, is, that is not good politics or you better yet have them as, as part of your um, decision making. And um, a, a suggestion that Gwilik suggested was to that we need to make use of our DEI officers when planning events or designing policies and all sorts of things. 
uh, Christelle, uh, Magnifica Christelle is also added. Baronial households are great places to have monthly newcomer meetings and a monthly diversity meeting. Amazing. So some more resources. Um, oh, this was more for teaching. I really should have not used these particular links, but they're still useful to think about because um, these are some common accessibility issues that are still useful to think about. Some more academic theory. Here are some books that you could look into that talk about uh, universal design primarily because that's where most of the writing has been. Um, and some of the, the criticisms of universal design. And I wanted to finish, well, almost finish uh, this with another piece of music, another verse from a song by uh, the bard from, I think, East Kingdom, I can't remember uh, kingdoms, uh, Drake Orinwood, and the song that uh, was definitely very inspiring for me. What might we hold if we hold the door open? What is it worth if we value each soul? If we stand in truth and we hold the door open, our kingdom might truly behold. Our kingdom might truly behold. For contact information, if you ever want to have some of these topics, uh, my email, I technically have an old blog. I haven't used it in a few years, but it is there. And I have written about various topics related to DEI and experiences. And I think that's the last slide. Do you have any questions or other things you want to talk about right now? Any last burning things that you want to think about, have us think about and talk about? I guess we're done then. Thank you for attending. It meant a lot to have people uh, who are willing to uh, participate and be involved and provide their own thoughts. And I hope you all have a good day, good month, good whatever you, uh, time of period you like to talk about. Thank you. And I guess, and recording? Yes.